so nice in your shirt. It's funny. Because in this article where Michael Caine talks about a new film he's in, Harry Brown, that was filmed on the Haygate estate, he says... It is about sink estates and the violence on them. This is a dark portrait, but unfortunately it's very true and we're all responsible for it. We left these children and they grew into animals. We've put them in rotten places like the Haygate Estate, which fortunately is being pulled down. It should never have been built. The 2009 deputy leader of the council, Kim Humphreys, responded. Michael Caine seems to be getting fact and fiction mixed up. It is one of the safest, cleanest and friendliest estates in South London. His remarks about the residents are totally wide of the mark. Um... But the leader of the council now, Peter John, says... There is a reason why Harry Brown, a vigilante movie starring Michael Caine, was filmed on the Haygate estate. Because it was it's unpleasant, unwelcoming and didn't work for the people who lived there. I mean, they shoot sci-fi movies in Iceland. It doesn't mean it's the fucking moon. Movies use places to create a false reality doesn't mean where they're filming is that thing. Videos are about creating a false reality. Like that interview in part one with the expert of space. The idea of capital debases every other use and... Oh, fuck, fuck, fuck. That expert was actually actress Lily Lesser playing one of my professors who couldn't appear on camera. So she read the transcribed conversation. And the character's name is actually just Rachel Weiss's character in The Mummy. Because me and Lily would both let Rachel Weiss be our daddy. Certainly not anything like Harry Brown. There's a difference between fact and fiction. Peter John struggles sometimes with the idea. My family lived on the Haygate estate for, uh, for its whole lifetime. They were reasonably happy there. Um, they didn't fear for themselves. They didn't fear for their safety. The lifts in the big blocks would break down more often than they should have done. There were problems with the heating. Really, the stories about how bad it was to live on the Halo Estate started to be generated from that, uh, that time, which is ironic because by 2007, the estate was being decanted. A lot of the people who lived there had left or were leaving. And because of the media interest when journalists and so forth, filmmakers visited, they did see an estate which was evidently in decline because it was being decanted. With, Right, for demolition. It didn't help, I should say, the reputation of the estate that Southwark Council let the estate out as a, as a location for films like Harry Brown and The Bill. But we had all sorts of films from the, the Block, Attack the Block. That was a good, that was a science fiction film, that was yeah. quite good. What, what's it? Is it War Z or Planet yeah, C? Yeah, World War Z. World War Z. Yeah, we were in World War Z. I didn't actually see that one. And as you can imagine, people were, 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 were pretty upset about it. My mum was certainly. Um, towards the, the end of her life. She was very unhappy about the way that the estate was being portrayed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Action! Fuck off! Fuck you! Fucking bricks! Unless they're going to film something, uh, you know, positive, it's always negative. It's always about someone getting knifed or someone getting shot, or someone getting murdered, you know. You begin to marry the images of violence and crime with the Haygate, retrospectively giving the council, who engineered the images being created in the first place, justification for knocking it down. 
There is a reason why Harry Brown, a vigilante movie starring Michael Caine, was filmed on the Haygate estate. Because it was, it's unpleasant, unwelcoming and didn't work for the people who lived there. Ed knows a thing or two about council's attitudes towards social housing. He lived in Grenfell Tower. Before the fire that claimed the lives of 72 people, instead of listening to their residents and keeping them safe by sorting out the faulty wiring that was causing power surges, giving them proper fire safety training, not clad in the building with flammable shit to save money, the local council were more interested in other things. Lining Ed's community up for regeneration. Here in the Royal Borough of Kensington, Chelsea, we can best describe our local authority as a property developer that was simply masquerading as a borough council. They viewed the land in North Kensington where Grenfell, um, Lancaster West Estate, Silchester Estate, some of the more traditional kind of working class communities are as basically uh, a gold mine. They didn't even have to dig for the gold. All they had to do was just to marginalise the people living there. That would open up possibilities for their contacts in property development to come in under the guise of regeneration. It was a direct attack on people who possibly they felt didn't have a right to live here. We felt like a carcass and they were the vultures. A gold mine, huh? Like somewhere that wasn't being used economically efficiently. Where all that silly social housing was getting in the way of something much better. Once the council has decided that they want the place demolished, you get a process of managed decline. Mm. And so, um, you know, repairs are not done. I always go around looking at, at, at different uh, estates and, and seeing if any investment has been put into them. You know, are the new windows, have they had a, you know, have they had a coat of paint recently? And when you look at, at, at estates that haven't had any investment in them, it, it's almost kind of like a bit of a kind of red, you know, like an alarm comes up. What's so easy for councils to do is to allow the managed decline of an estate, i.e. there is a plan, and that plan is not to have a plan. I mean, I wouldn't describe our estate as a slum, but it was heading towards kind of like slum-like conditions. And, you know, that's really offensive. I mean, you know, there was no need for it. In our borough, we had, you know, Royal Borough Kensington Chelsea had a third of a billion pounds in reserves. There was no reason to treat, you know, communities the way they were treating us. I really can't be sad to see the back of the Haygate. There were a lot of problems on the estates. The heating was always breaking down, the lifts would break down, there were rats, there were cockroaches. The aim at the end is to be able to say, look, this estate has run down into such a state of disrepair, the only way forward is to knock it down, supposedly rehouse people and regenerate. I don't think many people would be sad to see the back of the Haygate. The success of transformation is measured in the gap between what it was and is now. It was very run down. The buildings didn't look very nice. And obviously now we've got the new regeneration and it's a, a huge transformation. To reinforce the perception of a change takes a twofold manoeuvre before producing a new appearance. The accent is made on the former. Already exists. Improve things that are just not right and not good, but not change things that are absolutely right and very good. Be honest. Throughout watching this, has some small part of you thought, well, it, it does look a bit shit, this would actually be quite nice. You're not alone. I mean, it has loads of bad Google reviews. I don't even think that a lot of them are wrong. Some of them are just racist. But even those trying to be positive seem to write with a hint of melancholy, agreeing it's time things needed changing. But Lady Lena hit on something interesting. Delancey have been controlling this narrative for years before you even knew it. Because Delancey have owned the shopping centre 
since 2013, with their sacred regeneration plans tucked in their back pocket to increase appetite for change. They let things fall apart. Toilets block, mice swarm, the customers who came there to shop don't come as much. Businesses in the centre start to lose money. They come to you and say, hey, can you fix these things? We're losing customers. Just ignore them. It's all part of the plan. Nothing says revamp like closing down sale. Luxury developments popped up till the shopping centre felt like a musty tomb weighing down progress for the area. And then, Delancey appear saviours when their hugely profitable plans are finally revealed because, finally, somebody's doing something at least about the eyesore. Who the fuck writes a Google review for a shopping centre? And while it's there, the peel in paint spells something plain and clear. Middle class people stay away. It's what the new town centre, Elephant Park, and the entire regeneration is built on. A false reality that screams fear. Fear of social housing and the people who live in it. I read about yeah. a, a, the, the head of regeneration at the time, Fred Manson. Okay. And he said something like, Social housing generates people on low incomes coming in, and that generates poor school performances. Middle class people stay away. Do you think that is still the root of a lot of people's belief that are voting on this? I would like to think that no one thinks that now. Um, but I think it will have... You can the, what what people will talk about a lot is the need for mixed communities. This was about creating uh, a really vibrant and viable mixed tenure community. Okay, so if we look at it in the positive, most generous sense, it's a very very positive idea. It's mm. the idea that you know you have your doctor and your lawyers like living alongside the kind of nurses and cleaners in like this sort of classless society where everyone gets along. Yeah. And that's a positive thing, you know, I think we, we don't want social segregation on the basis of class, that's positive. It almost always means bringing middle class people into working class areas and almost never means bringing working class people into middle class areas. Mm -hmm. I think that's the problem with it. Mm -hmm. So what it does is it's, it pushes people out sometimes. And I think that there's a real risk of that is what will happen with the elephant. And as working class people are pushed out, the manufactured fear about what they are like justifies and breeds the segregation. Like when Len Lease decided they couldn't offer any social housing in One the Elephant, because then they'd have to pay for two separate lifts between the private and the social houses. They knew the rich people wouldn't pay the million pounds if they had to share a lift with a poor person. And even when London's developments are mixed, the in-house playgrounds are only open to the children who live in the luxury section. A well-placed hedge blocking it being used by the kids who live in the social housing. The lavish Ritz-like entrances for the luxury houses. Council tenants forced to use back alley poor doors. You see, that manufactured fear allows them to be treated worse and dehumanised. We get contacted all the time here at Grenfell United by housing people living in social housing from up and down the country talking about the way they're being treated and the similarities between the way they're being treated now to two years, two and a half years after Grenfell mm -hmm. and the way that we were treated before Grenfell. There is no difference. Nothing has changed. At the moment, if you live in social housing and you're having a problem with your landlord, the most effective way you have of getting that problem addressed is to take a photograph of it, put it onto social media, onto Twitter, 
and hoping that it gets picked up by your MP or you can embarrass your landlord enough to act. And what we're saying is post Grenfell, that's just simply not good enough. Every human being has a right to be treated with dignity and respect. And we became victims of, of, of a, a kind of, uh, you know, a, a local council that was definitely not treating us with dignity and respect. We've shown that, you know, any community that has a spotlight turned on it, once it's had the spotlight turned on it, we're full of riches, we're full of, you know, of, of worth, intelligence, you know, of steel and of an ability to fight back. And, uh, you know, they just never treated us with any respect. They, they never treated us with any dignity. And, and had they treated us with dignity and respect, Grenfell wouldn't have happened in the first place. It's one of the UK's largest regeneration projects, and it's been planned and constructed to include crime prevention measures from Secured by Design. The manufactured fear helps sell the houses. Getting Secure by Design involved from the onset has been critical to the success of Elephant Park. Then it's very different to how it used to look. Yep, it definitely is. Um, the landscaping is a lot better now and there's no recesses, nowhere for the criminals to hide. We also wanted to find out what burglars actually think about Secure by Design, so we conducted interviews with 22 prolific burglars currently serving a sentence in prison. The principles and guidance from Secured by Design can help people feel safer and make communities more cohesive. The old Haygate blocks, particularly the largest blocks, were not great for building a sense of community. They were inhuman in scale. What we want to replace them with are homes that are of a smaller scale where people can actually get to know their neighbours. Hey guys, today I'm filming a tour of our flat in London. Elephant Park is a place to live. Quite, it's actually very safe. So why is it safe? Because um, we have a special kind of device, a small device like trans transponder on our keys, which opens the main door and then it only allows the elevator to go on the floor where you're living. So if you're living on the fourth floor, you can only go to the fourth floor. But if you're living on the sixth floor, you can only go to the sixth floor. There are blocks that go up that I'm surprised people want to live in in some ways. Uh, the strata I find a bit bizarre because, you know, going in, you, you have a, like a fob that only takes you to your floor. So it's like, how can you possibly meet your neighbours? How can you, you know, yeah. oh, it, it's, it's, yeah. it's, I find that sort of atomised living yeah. uh, a, a little bit bizarre. Atomized living. Like the cosy and homely haven of the student rooms, part of Elephant One, Porchester House, situated snugly in the Piccadilly of the South. A Midland room, a gold classic, is £338 a week. £17,238 for the year. Just 167 square foot. Not much room for activities. And then their Facebook page posts fucking bullshit like this. Hey, when the student loan drops. But not even the maximum amount of student loan could cover living in Porchester House's cheapest rooms. So the only British kids that could afford to live there are rich. And every rich British kid's parents already own like a fourth home in Notting Hill, so they just live there. The only people that could really afford it are foreign students. What a great way to make friends, expand your horizons, and live London to the fullest. Eventually, it's what the whole of London will be. Because this is happening everywhere. 
segregated, sterile developments that feel like a Call of Duty map before you nuke it. Stuffed with rich people living in tiny rooms, too scared to venture outside. And we have like a garden only for residents. Concierges so we don't have to ask our neighbours to watch our keys. Boxed up, only knowing what we see on our newsfeed. Because when we're pouring more money into gates and fobs and cameras and guards, all to keep them out, humanity collapses. Safe in your fortress. Your castle. Empathy dissolving. Because poorer people who can't afford to live there are only ever on the other side of that gate. All the windows have got double locks and the door's got, you know, an extra security lock. The balconies are really high, no one can get over. So, yeah, I feel really safe here. There is a reason why Harry Brown, a vigilante movie starring Michael Caine, was filmed on the Haygate estate. So... When did it suddenly become beneficial to make this baseless argument? Londoners, the Elephant and Castle is a place where people travel through. What we wanted to do is... Nothing had happened under the Lib Dem Tory Coalition Council since the big regeneration plan in 2004. Well, apart from spending our money kicking people out of their homes. Promise after promise had been made to the community. It's happening now. Like by this dork who's clearly a 12-year-old in a suit. The regeneration could still include them. The regeneration could still be a good thing for the community. The elephant and castle has previously been described as Piccadilly of South East, but everyone can admit that it has seen better days. The Suffolk Council have recently invested 1.5 million in making the area a better place. I'm going to talk to local residents and find out what they think of the redevelopment and whether they think it's worth the money invested. Do you think the redevelopment will improve prospects for young people in a local area? Definitely. It will uh, expand the area, make it more uh, lively uh, for the community and uh, stuff like that. And uh, yeah, it's, it's going to be amazing because they're building houses onto it and it's going to be, uh, could the Olympics are coming in, it's going to pr uh, get more jobs in and stuff like that. But they were eager for certainty. So when Peter John's Labour Party gained control of the council in May 2010, they had a point to prove. They were eager to make progress. One of the things that came across clearly during the local elections uh, and why we won seats in this area on May the 6th is because we were saying, we were hearing from people that they're fed up that there'd been no progress. And, you know, this has been a project which has been spoken about for 10 or 12 years. And actually, residents in this area, having seen the Haygate decanted and people there rehoused, want to see some progress actually on the ground. They signed the Elephant Park deal with Lendlease. Just two months later. Is it rude to suggest that maybe the new Labour Council was so eager to finally be the ones to make it all happen? They rolled over and let the developers get away with too much? So they can humble brag like... There's been a huge amount of progress with the Elephant and Castle regeneration in the last couple of years. Well, today it's a very exciting day. We're uh, starting the demolition of the big blocks of the Haygate. It's something that's been planned since, oh, the late 1990s. So uh, 15 years on, it's great that this is finally happening. It's a really exciting time. People have been promised regeneration at the Elephant and Castle for 15 years and now it's really starting to happen. What we're seeing is a legacy of a refusal to fight over um, services and um, provision for local working class people. But our argument is, well, 
if you don't put your foot down and make decisions that are unpalatable to the development industry, they will continue to take the piss. Mm. Whilst I understand the position that the council is in, I fundamentally disagree that um, you make working class people's lives better by getting in bed with developers. Yeah. You understand the motivation of that private company, then that leads to certain conclusions, mm. which is that you don't treat them as if they're some kind of a partner that have a, an interest in making things better. They don't have an interest in doing that. They have an interest in, in getting their planning application approved and they will jump through a number of hoops to do that um, and the size of the hoops that you make them jump through, the height of them, is dependent, I believe, on the level of struggle that the local community puts up. The council are the people we elect to stand up to them, hold them to account, give them a tough ride, get the best deal for us. The council have been, what I can only describe as being terrific. Um, the, the relationship's very strong, um, it's very positive. Um, I've found them to be very much about you know, trying to make things happen, They're very much about can do rather than obstacle creation. Uh, and for us as developers that's extremely important. So you know, having an element of certainty about uh, outcomes for us has clearly been very important. Does this give you confidence that they did that? When he says the council gave an element of certainty about uh, outcomes for us. Does he mean certainty of profits? When he describes the relationship as very strong. Does he mean the ticket his company bought for Peter John to the Olympic opening ceremony worth £1,600? It did look like good fun, to be honest. Or when they paid £1,200 for him to go to MIPIM in 2013 when it was held in the south of France. And we all know what happens there. James was on the planning committee in July. He voted against Delancey's shopping centre plans. The planning process has been undermined, so it's now euphemistically described as being very pro-development, um, which means essentially pro-capital, which means that developers, people with lots and lots of money, um, essentially call the shots as much as possible. So the, the clearest sample of that comes into the Elephant Castle redevelopment. So in this case, we had a policy that said we need this kind of layout of different types of affordable housing. The council set out a list of expectations that developers should meet with new builds. Percentages of housing being built. The developer is able to then say, OK, we can't make that viable. So the, that's where this term viability comes in, which is relatively new and really, really undermines the planning process. Things like the viability assessments have to be more public. They repeatedly come up with so-called viability assessments to demonstrate how poor they are and why they can't do it. The kind of viability assessments that they carry out, the amount of people that actually do get rehomed back on the estate, um, isn't always what they tell you at the beginning. Let's talk about the single biggest flaw in local government, which hands developers all the power. Viability assessments. Now, I know what you're thinking. Mm, I love it when you say sexy words. But this is important. So put your various reproductive organs away and listen. So the viability assessment means if the developer can show that by sticking to the plan, sticking to our requirements as a democratically organised local authority, they can't make a, a viable amount of profit, which is 20%, then they don't have to meet those obligations. So before, you might have said, OK, well, we can't meet the obligations, therefore we're not going to do it. But now they can instead say, OK, we are going to do this, but we're just not going to give you the affordable housing that you demand. The developer's profit comes before the democratic wishes of the local authority, comes before the well-being of the people in the local community, and comes before creating a community space that works for everyone. By law, it's how you end up with this. That 20% profit for the developers has to be kept. And if building the social houses they're meant to build stops them getting that 20%, 
they can just not build the social houses. Halfway through the development, they can say, look, our, you know, our viability assessment has, has gone off course. We, we said we were going to provide housing for everyone. We, we can't do that now. And we can't, but if, if, we, if you don't allow us to finish the project, there'll be no development at all. So it's, it's, it's just a very risky game. And then an added complication is when they produce the viability assessments, they don't actually have to use real numbers. So they don't necessarily use the amount of money that it costs them to buy the land. They use a formula to work out what that land is worth. And when they're talking about what they're going to sell the flats for, they can use current market prices for flats on a development that's going to take 20 years to build and unsurprisingly is expected to have much higher um, yields at that point. So it's all sort of fantasy, mm. Mm. all in their favour. So it really is essentially just that, yeah, that profit is put over the needs of anyone else. Yes. Um, everybody is very, very sceptical about these viability assessments and their, and their, and their, um, and their validity. Uh, but they're still, we still have them. They're a little bit more contested now. Local authorities are a little bit more reluctant just to accept them at face value. But uh, we still have them. We've got to get rid of them. <laughs> oh, and the council spent 56k of Lendlease's money in court fees, trying to keep you, or me, from ever seeing Elephant Park's viability assessment from everyone seeing how few social houses they're building. And sometimes, when the council really want the shit to be built, their own policy requirements on affordable houses the developers should build don't even seem to matter. Like Delancey's shopping centre plans. I, I would... <laughs> We are not opposed to delivering more affordable housing here, genuinely we are not opposed, but we're at a breaking point in terms of not being able to deliver the project. <gasps> Was that Stafford? If you follow our rules you might not make quite the amount of profit you want to make. Oh well, fuck the rules that we were democratically elected to enforce, we need our new town centre. Don me Stafford, don me. This whole planning committee system is so hugely unequipped to properly hold these fuckers to account. As a planning committee member, I was given just over a week um, to read the papers for this, which were hundreds and hundreds of pages. So there will be bits in there that I'm not fully up to speed with, and I think that realistically everyone knows that that's going to be the case. A council is a part-time role, so I'm a teacher at the same time. I teach primary school kids, you know, and you can't be planning lessons and marking like piece of children's drawings at the same time as reading 600 pages <laughs> of intricate <laughs> planning documents. <laughs> and that's the point. Jamie and Stafford don't want James or the councillors to actually read it. They make all this shit so fucking boring long and hard to understand on purpose. In the like 40s and 50s, when people started talking about um, future dystopias, about totalitarianism and stuff, there was the kind of 1984 idea that you have um, information really, really restricted mm. and it's controlled and it's manipulated and changed and that means you, you can't access the truth. But then there's the other alternative, which is kind of more Brave New World, where actually there's just so much information that the truth is just lost. Mm. We have a huge amount of information given to us about all this stuff and the truth is in there and it can be sometimes quite hard to find and sometimes, worse still, the things that you really need to know are the one thing that isn't in there. My next question <laughs> was, do developers have too much power? Which it, it, it kind of sounds like they do. So they're the people very much driving this whole process. It is very much rigged towards them, essentially, yeah. Mm. I mean, it could be a lot worse. I mean, they, they, it could be completely free reign, and if you're in the land, you can do whatever you like. Yeah. Um, so it's not that there aren't things in place to protect local people. And, you know, there were, the initial plan that came forward back in February, January, February, um, wasn't as good as the one that we eventually got. Yeah. So concessions were made, and so it's not like they have total power. There are things in the way of them, both in terms of the democratic processes of the council and, indeed, the public opinion generated by people in the streets. Mm. And you know the kind of people who can't stand to not have complete control? 
The developers are well aware that the council are the only thing potentially standing in their way. So they learn all the council's secrets. But how? It's simple. You hire this guy. My name's Kim Humphreys. I'm managing director of Carl Ventures. This is Kim Humphreys. Yeah, the same Kim Humphreys from the Michael Caine article. Former Conservative Deputy Leader of the Council and Executive Member for Housing. People elected him to protect them against developers doing whatever they wanted. So after he left the council in 2010, he founded Carville Ventures, a real estate consultancy business where he advertises that he has insider knowledge of the council's inner workings. How it ticks, the hoops he learned about he can help developers jump through for a price. Kim Humphreys at Carville knows Southwark Council incredibly well and we needed somebody with those kind of connections to assist through the planning process uh, to ultimately deliver the scheme for us. Kim was hired by Delancey to be their advisor on the shopping centre proposal. He went to school with Jamie Ripblatt, Eton of course, so they knew they could trust each other. Both myself and Kathy Bowman were senior politicians within Southwark Council and know the area really well. Kim enlists his old council buddies to come work for him. The more expertise on how to get stuff through the council, the more money they can charge, right? Former Southwark Cabinet Member for Regeneration, Catherine Bowman, now Client Director at Carville, boasts she can help developers have an effective relationship with the council. She was a councillor for 16 years, there from the very beginning. She wrote the fucking foreword to the entire Regeneration Master Plan in 2004. So yeah, she probably knows a few people at the council. For their website branding, Carville chose something that represented their crowning achievement. And their legacy. There are other council, former council employees who have gone on to work for Lendlease. You know, is there a perception that that's a problem as well? I don't, I don't think so. I mean, you know, uh, I don't know. Well, you know, why? Why? It, it, perception, but reality, no. Okay. Many will say that Peter John and Southwark Council's reasons for executing the regeneration the way they have is purely ideological to further their agenda of creating a borough that's economically affluent because it looks good for them. But I'm not so sure. In my hours of research, I found something that throws that into question. Something so disturbing, it'll make you think about this whole thing differently. I propose this. Peter John did it all to impress this girl. Hey guys, today I wanted to show you Elephant and Castle. Uh, how it changed over the last years. You probably know it as a kind of ghetto style neighborhood with tons of like social housing. But to be honest, Elephant and Castle is changing and um, now instead of a famous Haygate estate, you can see these houses. And yeah, they are pretty cool and the whole neighborhood is, is different now. So that was the small excursion around the Elephant and Castle for me. And to summarize, 
It's still not a nice area to live. Shit. Oh well. Maybe your next regeneration will impress her, Peter.